Hello, fine folks of all varieties and walks of life. What do you think of my haircut, huh? I know, pretty wacky, pretty weird, pretty wild, but that's how I like to do it. Now, I am going to talk about something really quite, quite different than my, uh, my regular subject matter because um, I've really just fallen, especially with being in the process of writing um, a neo-noir style true crime novel, I've really fallen in love with um, uh, the writer Dennis Lehane. Now, um, let me just give you some background. All I knew about him prior to uh, watching the show Blackbird, which is um, to do with Larry Hall and the man who was um, recruited uh, by law enforcement to extract a confession from him, and it's a very creepy show, and the performances are amazing. I would highly recommend it, not for the faint of hearts, very gruesome, like most of Lehane's work, um, but uh, it's genuinely creepy and has the most violent riot scene I've seen in a film, which is saying something, like prison riot scene. <laughs> like full-on dudes in wheelchairs getting pushed over and getting their throats cut. Like, excessive through the top violence but um i've revisited after you know getting to the end of the episodes they've released periodically every friday because it's one of those streaming series where they're still doing that television format of new episode comes out every friday I did it like i don't particular i mean I, I guess it must work but i i i find it kind of frustrating of a format anyways um you know streaming services are supposed to be something that gives you, um, you know, assets that make it superior to television. Anyways, that's besides the point. Now, Dennis Lehane, all I knew about him was that he had been behind the story of Shutter Island. And um, I loved watching Shutter Island back in the day when I was hungover after partying. Um, I thought it was a great movie. Um, I thought it was a fun movie. I always loved psychological thrillers. Um, now, uh, it was, I, I remember years ago after first watching the movie, looking into kind of the material behind it, because, you know, Scorsese, Scorsese typically doesn't, uh, uh, option his own screenplays except for, you know, his films like Mean Streets. I think he maybe participated in the screenplay of The Irishman, but, like, uh, like they're typically derived from other people's works, um. Uh, you know, like Taxi Driver it was a Paul Schrader script. Paul Schrader, you know, I'm a big fan of his stuff. He's, you know, not as uh, palatable in terms of his work for the masses, at least outside of Taxi Driver. But with Lehane, I do remember seeing his name popping up in the credits uh, of The Wire for season three and season four. And, um, so I revisited his works, Gone Baby Gone. Um, I could I could make a video on just um, the fascinating questions that that posed to me. Um, but um, what I want to talk about is the adaptation that he's most renowned for, which I just watched again for probably the first time in about 15 years. So I had virtually no recall of uh, what the outcome of the story was. I knew vaguely what it was about, but that's about it. And um, I want to put my undergraduate psychology student cap on and uh, also, you know, amateur armchair philosopher cap on and um, tell you what I think is really going on in Mystic River. So, for those of you who don't know the the film or do know the film seen it but you know don't quite remember the outcome um and you know don't feel like watching it again i'm gonna with spoilers go through the film really quick beat by beat by beat film start, starts with um three friends and i believe the 70s they're writing um their names in cement on the sidewalk you know, I've done this before with friends. I actually, you know, I remember once I was reading Faulkner and I wrote, My Mother is a Fish, which is a chapter in As I Lay Dying, as 
one of the characters who's already mentally deficient has uh, sunstroke and he's just kind of babbling nonsensically and it's a stream of consciousness that's all he says in the chapter um, but uh, in any case they're doing that and uh, Rawls the guy who played Rawls in The Wire comes up um, with a guy who's like a priest of some capacity and uh, basically takes one of them sexually abuses them for four days and the story picks up you know 30 40 years later um, and so all the all the characters are now um, one of them is a cop one of them is a former criminal running a convenience store and the other uh, is the abused who's a blue-collar worker who is still very much haunted by the events of what happened to him and um, essentially the, the 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 former criminal um his daughter gets murdered um she gets shot and basically dumped and um causes this huge manhunt and it is revealed that um dave the individual who was abused showed up that night um to his house covered in blood saying he had killed a mugger now this information gets out in their community through his wife who's very concerned and this reveals that the gangster is still very much um, a gangster. Um, and so he, you know, gets Dave, the abused individual, inebriated and um, tries to get him to confess along the banks of the Mystic River to this homicide of his daughter. Um, and um, he tells them that no, what actually happened was that he killed um, a pedophile who was exploiting a child prostitute. Um, and he talks about how he has this sort of dissociative identity, uh, personality disorder. Um, and usually I hate when movies play with dissociative identity personality disorder because it's a very contentious subject. It's something that's still like really um, debated as to like how valid it is in, in uh, psychiatry, psychology, but um, you know, it makes sense that someone who's under immense trauma would create fantasy worlds to escape to. And so he related himself to vampires and werewolves quite a bit. And so kind of he starts to do that and the gangster misconstrues this as him confessing to the murder of his daughter. Um, but he says something very interesting and this is going to be, keep this in mind because this is central to my hypothesis. He says, what if we all three got in that car and we're still in that basement to this day? And so, essentially he kills him, throws him in the Mystic River. Um, the film ends with uh, the gangster essentially confessing to the cop. And um, then they're at a, uh, a, a communal sort of parade and... Uh, you know, the, the son of the man who was murdered um, under false pretenses, um, you know, he's not there, so the sun doesn't wave, um, but what you do see is a series of gestures between, um, the gangster and the cop, who are friends. The gang, or the cop goes, gangster goes. Now, on Wikipedia, I looked this up, and it says on Wikipedia what the cop was saying was, I'm going to get you. And the gangster was saying, I can't help who I am. Now, I don't think that's entirely correct. I think the, I think it was more so, um, him saying, um, like, how can I best, uh, encapsulate this? It was him saying, you know, here we are, this is what we've done. And uh, he goes, you know, what, what can we do? We're, we're, we're stuck. We're stuck in where we are and as who we are now because we've cemented these lives for ourselves. And that's where the film ends. Now, my hypothesis, what is really going on here? Let me take you back to that line about, and actually I think this line was uttered during the confession and not during the slang, um, so right after, and the scene after 
the day of the abuse gets killed, it's I think it's actually between the cop and the gangster that he says we could all three be in that basement. I think that's actually what's happening. I think there's all three in that basement and they've all three, um, they've devised in their minds these fantasies of lives they could have had as they're being abused. Because, you know, if you look at their roles, they're all stereotypical cookie cutter roles um, that a kid would be familiar with. Cop, gangster, and then a monster, a werewolf, a vampire. Um, first one to get into the car, so maybe the one who they are subconsciously blaming for what happened. And they dream up based on events they knew that happened, like the Just Ray guy where the gun came from that was used in the slaying of the daughter, using the same gun to rob a liquor store, well, like way back when. I mean, uh, this could, that could be invalid because that, that information may have, or that, that event, that robbery may have transpired after they were kidnapped. I actually am pretty sure it, it, it did now that I mention it. So that may not be true, but the rest, I think, is just a fabrication um, in the minds of many abused youngsters um, who are still kept in the cellar uh, where they are, you know, being forced to experience sensory deprivation and have all dissociated into taking on a role that they felt suited them and that they felt afforded them a degree of power. And... Um, it's, uh, it's very much like, uh, like Plato's Black Iron Prison, you know? You have these people hanging from a dungeon, and all they see is light with shadows passing by on the dungeon walls across from them. But what they don't know is that that light is essentially just, it's, it's like a candle with uh, cutouts of people spinning around it, so it looks real to them. It is essentially an illusion. But after watching Dennis Lehane's other material, um, I can say that that's not what he was going for. Yes, he was, you know, yes, or well, yes, he is a competent uh, psychological uh, thriller um, author. Did Shutter Island very well, even though he did Shutter Island as a pulpy sort of satire on psychological mental institution based fiction um and um i think the message um that you're supposed to take away from this film is uh very much uh similar to what's presented in gone baby gone um which you know again i can really get into that film not on uh not on a subtextual level like uh i am with mystic river but on a moral versus you know what prevails morality the justice system sort of thing um if you really want me to but that's not what i'm here to do in this video so in terms of the the, the moral lesson here um what makes this a parable is um the fallibility of human judgment um, the, uh, danger of living in sort of a vacuum, um, where, you know, you are essentially going off of the information offered, presented by those around you, you know, and how these sort of judgments, these conclusions that lead to the end of someone's life through, you know, forcefully taking it. Um, are, you know, just incredible gambles that can, you know, make or break a life that is already, in this case, damaged, like Dave, the abused. Um, now, that's sort of my overall take on it, but I want to talk about Dennis Lehane for a second. One reason I've learned to really admire him as an author um, is because he was a social worker. Um, and so that, like, that's why most of his works are about, um, children who have been, you know, forcibly abused by, um, you know, sick people, uh, 
sadistic pedophiles, family members, um, communities being neutral to what's going on behind closed doors and under their noses. And like, I can see why he was recruited to write for the, the Wire, despite him, you know, having more of a basis in his, or, or basing more of his stories in Boston as opposed to Baltimore. Um, but it's because he had that real experience to back him. And it really shows when a writer knows the source material they're talking about because they've lived it. You know, you see it in David Simon, you see it in Ed Burns, the two primary writers for The Wire because David Simon was, you know, a Baltimore Sun uh, journalist who was assigned, uh, or I, I don't know if he took the job voluntarily, but in any case, he ended up working the beat with the cops in Baltimore for a year and wrote about how corrupt they were and essentially, you know, he had a dictionary type uh, um, thing at the end uh, that described all, not just kind of the, the code words that cops would use, like say over um, a, a radio or whatever and interacting with dispatch, but codes cops would just say to each other on the streets. Um, and then you had Ed Burns, who was, um, you know, lived a really amazing life, well, was a beat cop, was an inner city s school uh, teacher. I think Presbulewski uh, in The Wire is based on him. Uh, so, um, you know, this is why the fourth season of The Wire is about inner city school kids and why it's considered one of the best seasons because it's accurate, it's based on his experience. And uh, Ed Burns had, you know, he had a pair on him because, you know, despite being a former cop, he went out and lived with drug dealers for a year and wrote The Corner. Corner, The Beat, um, I believe that's what Dan, David Simon called his book. I could be wrong. Feel free to correct me on that. Merged into the hit show, The Wire. And then they, they recruited other great authors like George Pelicanos, who's a tremendous crime author, which, you know, led to the um, addition of uh, the Greek uh, drug supply. Uh, coming from the ports, you know, in the second season, which is considered by most to be the worst season of The Wire. I, I remember when I first watched The Wire, I found it to be the most out of place season, but I learned to appreciate it for its, uh, the way it ties into the rest of the show. It's just thematically a very dramatic shift from the first season and then the rest of the seasons. But, um, in any, in, in any case, um, yeah, I just, uh, I, I wanted to make this because I, I found, uh, you know, Mystic River, Gone Baby Gone, Blackbird, <sighs> Shutter Island, anything done by Dennis Lehane, or writers who know what they're talking about, like The Wire, which is my favorite show for a reason, and I can talk about The Wire till you know, the sun goes down. Um, it is seriously that powerful of a show to me. I've watched it through many, many times. Um, and will probably continue to do so for the rest of my life, and I'm someone who typically hates repetition. Um, but, uh, yeah, anyways, to sum it up with Mystic River, I infer that they are still in that basement, and they have created, like kids do when they're playing in the sandbox or playing soldiers, an illusion of a life, because they had none, nothing to actually supplement and balance out the atrocious, unending, forced sexual abuse that they were experiencing. And so cons consequentially, um, their minds, which were wrought with guilt and um, apparent survivor's guilt because they thought they made it out except for their friend, ends up causing them to turn on their friend and let the gangster kill him while the other one kind of turns a blind eye to it and doesn't do anything to prosecute him. M morally, again, it's, um, you know, the, the unreliability of, say, vigilante justice, um, how, uh, you know, communal, uh, um, attempts to rectify an atrocity can lead to mob mentality type behavior 
and also just how violence, uh, as shown in the revealing of the true killers who were um, essentially the younger brother of the person the daughter wanted to marry and run off with. They didn't want their brother to go, um, so they recruited a friend um, to try to scare the girl with a gun, the gun that was used in the robbery, and they accidentally shoot her, they clip her, and they don't want her to tell anyone, so they shoot her fatally and they dump her body, and he just kicks the ever-living shit out of them. And like these kids, he beats the crap out of them. Like he's like kicking one of them in the face. And um, the kid pulls the gun on him and he attempts to shoot him. Uh, he attempts to kill him. Um, but you know, he's, he's, his attempt is thwarted at the last second as the cops break in. And um, it shows how that escalation of violence upon hearing what really happened only led to more hate and division and the uh the crippling of more young lives um and so with that being said i gotta go to school you guys keep it real send your love my way i love you all right back we'll catch you later